In Total War Three Kingdoms, you'll take control of a warlord of ancient China and unite the land under your banner. Together, we'll look at each of the starting warlords, detailing their playstyle, who they were, and how it all panned out for them historically. Kong Rong, the master scholar, is a descendant of the great philosopher Confucius. Armed with quick wits and literary ability, he influences the people of China by wielding a dangerously sharp tongue. Known for his intelligence from a young age, there's a story from when Kong Rong was only four years old that's still told to children in China today. Kong Rong was a middle child, and one day his father brought home some pears for them. He handed Rong the biggest pear, but Rong gave it back and took the smallest one instead. His father was curious, so he asked why he had done that. Because I am younger, so my older brothers should eat the bigger ones. So shouldn't your little brother eat the smallest one? The father asked. Well, I'm older than him, so I should take care of him and leave him the bigger pear. To anyone watching that's not a parent, just know that's the most heartwarming thing he could have possibly said, and it's the kind of thing you hope a child grows up to champion. That's not to say Kong Rong didn't have a rebellious teenage phase. When he was old enough to have a chocolate milk stain of a mustache, he decided to flex his burgeoning intellect on the local gentry, where he talked his way into a nearby palace by claiming to be an old friend. When the lord of the house didn't recognize him, Kong Rong revealed that his ancestor, the great philosopher Confucius, was friends with the lord's ancestor. The Lord's court was not amused, and one commented that many children who show ability at a young age grow up to be worthless. Kong Rong retorted, Then I suppose you must have been quite smart when you were young. It's that razor-sharp tongue that's the interesting dichotomy of Kong Rong, a compassionate man who actively sought to help the people. But when challenged, he would show that 11 times out of 10, he was the smartest man in the room and weaponizes wit to cut you back down to size. Beloved by those around him, he was given the governorship of the town of Beihai, where he was renowned for his hospitality and poetic verse, and would often say, let the rooms be full of friends and the cups be full of wine. That is what I like. At the game's start in 8190, you'll find that playing as Kong Rong is a relatively peaceful experience, favoring a pacifist playstyle that rewards peaceful trade while spreading education and knowledge. For Kong Rong, knowledge is power, and his strategy is to inform and educate the people to beat the enemy in their hearts and minds, and only stoops to bloodshed as a last resort. Trade influence is a new system in Total War Three Kingdoms, used by all factions to decide how much they benefit from a trade agreement. Trade income is determined by comparing trade influence between two factions. The more trade influence you have, the more of the shared pot will flow to you as income, and the more you'll benefit from trade agreements. The Creative Assembly has poised Kong Rong as a master of the art of trade, and he has the unique trade monopoly option in diplomacy, something added to Kong Rong since CA released his Warlord Legends profile, so you may be hearing about it here for the first time. Unlike trade agreements, Kong Rong's trade monopolies work to fill his monopoly meter, which gives you additional trade influence the more you have, though it does slowly deteriorate at higher levels. But all of this comes with a trade-off, where every army you field reduces faction-wide trade influence by 35%. Kong Rong himself also gains 50% trade influence while he's faction leader, and with a boost to population growth, it means that Kong Rong is truly a tall strategy faction, not needing to expand his borders, and instead piggybacking on expansionistic warlords by forging lucrative trade agreements. You'll then invest that wealth back into your settlements, building large cities, which mean more prestige as well as wealth, allowing you to take Kong Rong to war if you have to, but also enabling him to win the campaign with just a few territories under his command, if you so choose. To help you along your way, you'll have access to his unique crossbow infantry, arguably the best in the game, as well as the unique Academies of Culture Building, a school that promotes Confucian enlightenment and learning for everyone's benefit, giving bonuses to population growth, public order, and income from all sources, everything you'll need to keep those cities getting bigger. The only downside to Kong Rong is that he starts the game as a loyal Han governor, and as such cannot declare himself emperor directly, Instead, you'll have to wait until someone else declares themselves emperor and then take their capital for yourself. Kong Rong's campaign begins in Beihai County, surrounded by yellow turbans, and your first missions will have you securing the entire Qing province from them. At this point, a new yellow turban rebellion will rise up against you, one that you'll likely be unable to defeat on your own. Luckily, the great warrior, Tai Shi Zhe, who we'll get to in a minute, arrives in the nick of time, leaving you with a choice. Do you recruit him into your army, or send him to the nearby Pingyun County? 
to request help from the great warlord Liu Bei. Either way, you'll need powerful assistance if you expect to finally crush the Yellow Turban Rebellion. From there, it'll be a matter of securing the peninsula from the Han Empire and upgrading your commandery through ludicrous trade deals until the time comes to strike out and topple one of the new Three Kingdoms. Historically speaking, when Kong Rong became governor of Beihai in AD 190, he inherited a county that suffered greatly in the Yellow Turban Rebellion. Once in office, Kong Rong concentrated on rebuilding the city and establishing schools that promoted Confucian studies, which taught reciprocity, empathy, and kindness. Summarized by the word Shu, never impose on others what you would not choose for yourself. Practicing what he taught, Kong Rong invited refugees to shelter inside the city walls and gave proper funerals to those that he found had no families left to bury them. In the countryside, he made sure the wives, children, and mothers of men who had been drafted into the distant armies were taken care of and not left to starve under his care. Kong Rong became known as a good and honest man, a scholar who embodied the works of his ancestor Confucius and was looked to throughout China as an example for what is good and right. And like so often occurs, this was seen as a weakness. A new yellow turban army rose up that surrounded the city of Beihai and demanded food and tribute. If Kong Rong paid the ransom, everyone inside the city would starve. If he fought back, they would be beaten. And so the governor found himself trapped in the city he had just rebuilt. But from the walls, Kong Rong saw one man riding through the yellow turbans as they scattered before him. Tai Shi Zhu fought through their lines single-handedly and then kneeled at the feet of Kong Rong. Recently returned from the army, he had come home to find his mother had been cared for by the governor. Living alone, she had not suffered like so many others that he had seen, and Kong Rong had treated her with the honor deserved of one who had raised a great warrior. To repay this, she had asked her son to go and do all he could to help the scholar. Tai Shi Zhu asked to take control of the city garrison and sally out from the walls, but with 10,000 yellow turbans surrounding them, it was a suicide mission. Kong Rong had a better use for the man's talent. He gave him a letter to deliver to a nearby governor, the great hero Liu Bei. But having broken through their lines once already, the yellow turbans were on their guard. At dawn, Tai Shi Zhu took his bow and rode out from the fortress, carrying with him a target stand for archery practice. When the rebels saw Tai Shi Zhu coming, they readied for battle, only to see the man place the targets in the ditch, fire some arrows at them, and then return back inside. The following day, he did the same thing, some of the rebels prepared for battle, but most just watched Tai Shi Zhu practicing, marveling at the legendary warrior's abilities. On the third day, they paid him no mind. So Tai Shi Zhu charged through the camp, showing what regular practice can accomplish and leaving a trail of bodies in his wake. No one dared to pursue him. When he arrived at Ping Yun, he opened the message for Liu Bei. You are known for your kindness, righteousness, and willingness to help those in need. Kong Rong admires you and has placed his hopes in you. Only you can save him. It's recorded that Liu Bei smiled when he heard this. So Kong Rong knows that Liu Bei exists in this world. As the saying goes, flattery will get you everywhere. Liu Bei, Guan Yu, and Zhang Fei, along with 3,000 troops, followed Tai Shi Zhu back to Beihai. The rebels fled before them, crushed against the city walls by a tide of horsemen. His vow fulfilled, Tai Shi Si left to go south, refusing any gifts for his service. Liu Bei and Kong Rong would become fast friends and were united in their opposition to the growing power of the warlord Cao Cao. In AD 195, in recognition for all that he had done, Kong Rong was made governor of the entire Qing province, nominated by none other than Liu Bei. But the next year brought war again to his doorstep. When Yun Shao invaded from the north, Kong Rong's forces were defeated and he narrowly escaped to the new capital of Zicheng, now ruled by the prime minister of the Han Empire and his previous enemy, Cao Cao. Though Kong Rong's renown was such that he was still given a post as minister steward. Despite his posh titles, Kong Rong soon found that he and the warlord Cao Cao still did not see eye to eye on what was best for China, and he took it upon himself to play devil's advocate and expose Cao Cao for the bully he was. When Cao Cao imposed a ban on alcohol due to crop shortages, Kong Rong sent him a letter saying that since the last two kings were overthrown because of women, why not ban sex as well? Kong Rong lost his position for that gaffe, 
Though he didn't seem to mind much, his house was still known for its hospitality and was always filled with guests, where he would openly criticize Cao Cao in matters of politics, strategy, morals, and even poetry, coming up with inventive ways to insult him, even trying to convince Cao Cao that he wasn't powerful enough to defeat Yun Shao in a war meeting. And when a paragon of virtue speaks out against you, someone seen as a new embodiment of Confucius, people listen and whisper and plot. In 8208, Cao Cao had had enough of the undermining jests. When Kong Rong was seen speaking with an emissary of Sun Quan, he was accused of plotting a rebellion and slandering the imperial court. He and his entire family were sentenced to death. In the end, Kong Rong still believed himself the smartest man in the room, and undoubtedly thought that Cao Cao wouldn't dare arrest such a prolific scholar who had actively fought for the people of China. Maybe he even expected that all those that he had helped would rise up to protect him. But as Cao Cao's men went to arrest Kong Rong, they found him alone, with his two children playing a game of Go. When a soldier asked why they didn't try to escape, the boy replied, how could there be unbroken eggs under a toppled nest? When a family is broken, no one escapes unscathed. In the end, no one stepped in to help them as Confucius had taught, and no one even dared collect their bodies as they rotted in the street. A particularly sad twist, considering Kong Rong had seen to the proper burial of so many others forgotten by society in the unending wars. So what kind of player is Kong Rong for? Well, if you want to pursue a strategy of building tall with a peaceful playthrough, Kong Rong is your best option. He's the choice for the sharp minds out there that cut to the heart of the problem. A hero for those who focus on the greater good in service to others where, under sage guidance, you can build an empire of brick, body, and mind, with minimal bloodshed, but plenty of wine among friends. The visuals for today's episode was recorded by House of Danion, who recently released a gorgeous little video on Three Kingdoms and can be found regularly streaming on Twitch. Make sure to check out his channel linked in the comments below. If you'd like to learn more about the Warlords of the Three Kingdoms, you can find their stories on this channel. And as always, thanks for watching.